Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Joel Hornberger, the Chief Strategy Officer and National Training Director at Cherokee Health Systems, headquartered in Knoxville, Tennessee. I had the good fortune to hear Joel speak last fall at an event sponsored by the New Hampshire, Vermont chapter of HFMA and invited him to be on the podcast. And I have to say, I'm really pleased that he did. Cherokee Health Systems is a combined federally qualified health center and community mental health center, which is kind of unique. But when you hear center, don't be fooled. Cherokee provides care for more than 70,000 patients through its 23 brick-and-mortar locations and an additional 23 telemedicine sites. Cherokee has been an innovator in the area of integrating behavioral health and primary care, which is the focus of my conversation with Joel today. In the interview, we talk about how Cherokee uses embedded behavioral health counselors to collaborate with primary care providers, as well as how the clinic developed a unique rating system called the BIPSA to quantify the needs of individual patients, among a number of other things. I really enjoyed talking with Joel because his passion for integrated care and the FQHC mission is so apparent. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And if you do enjoy the podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Joel Hornberger. Welcome to the podcast, Joel. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Joel, you earned your Bachelor of Science from Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Uh, what drew you to Lebanon Valley College, and, and what was your major? What did you study? Well, I had a wonderful high school teacher, and he was a chemistry teacher, and, and uh, he told me that Lebanon Valley had a really excellent chemistry program. And so I, um, I thought, well, that would be a, a good school to go to. It was also pretty close to my home, about 30 minutes. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, Dutch country in southeast Pennsylvania. And so uh, it was just kind of natural to go there and, and study chemistry. So, so you majored in chemistry. Did you have in mind that you'd maybe go pre-med or something like that? Or was it just uh, that interest at that point? I think that was a, a possible goal. I, I was always interested in healthcare. My mother was a nurse. And so uh, she always encouraged me to get into healthcare in some capacity. And, and I started off as chemistry as a chemistry major, ended up graduating as a biology major. I was oh, interested okay. in, in both and, and really uh, enjoyed biology a little bit more than chemistry. All right. Well, pretty soon after you graduated, it looks like you went on to Johns Hopkins, where you earned a Master of Health Science and Health Services Administration and Planning. What was the, what drew you? away from kind of the hard sciences and towards healthcare administration. Yeah, what's interesting is is that I had a, a, a short hiatus there between graduating from Lebanon Valley and then going to Hopkins. I was a, a VISTA volunteer, Volunteers in Service to America, kind of like the Domestic Peace Corps. And I taught adult literacy in Philadelphia. And it was just remarkable and eye-opening to me uh, how challenging some people's lives are and so uh, a lot of the people that I taught reading and writing to had never learned that before and I, I, I don't know if this data is still the same but it was like one in five people were uh, functionally illiterate and so uh, it was just an eye-opening experience and and as a result of that I really got interested more in what a, a person can do in terms of leadership and how that set of skills, management skills, leadership skills, can really impact lives, especially for, you know, kind of vulnerable people that are the most in need. And, and so uh, I toyed with the idea of becoming a social worker for a, a short time, and, uh, and that kind of went away um, and then was replaced by this program at Hopkins. So how did you make that jump from, from being a VISTA yeah. literacy teacher to, to, to healthcare administration. I mean, I get the leadership piece, but that's kind of a big job. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And I, I would love to tell you that it was all planned and well <laughs> thought out and, and so on, but it wasn't. 
I was interested in going to graduate school and I wasn't quite sure what. I was toying with a lot of different things and and I uh, heard about the healthcare administration program at Hopkins. And uh, as you know, it's, it's pretty competitive to get in. And I thought, you know, you know, I'll just I'll just give it a shot and try. And and so I was pleasantly surprised when when they accepted me. And and so it was not as planful and and established as I would have liked it to have been. But it it all. Happened the way it's supposed to. All right. So after you graduated from Hopkins, you worked in a in a series of managed care companies. So this was kind of the early eighty, or this was the eighties through the eighties. Uh, what drew you into managed care as opposed to say going to a, you know, going to a, a hospital or maybe some other fixed facility kind of thing? Uh, great question. And when I did my internship at Hopkins, I did it at an FQHC in an inner city federally qualified health center in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it was a, a wonderful experience and I really enjoyed it. But again, uh, this sounds very mercenary and, and I apologize to you and to your audience members, but managed care was really kind of an exciting place in those days. A lot of HMO development, a lot of PPO development, healthcare costs were skyrocketing and, and uh, managed care was viewed as the uh, way to you know, control that to some extent. So it was an exciting area. Plus, I had some friends in that industry that recruited me to that area. And so I uh, went into that at uh, Blue Cross. So it was a very educational experience. Okay. So you spent about eight, nine years working in a couple of different organizations, Blue Cross, one of them. What did you learn in that first part of your career in healthcare that you've kind of carried forward with you? Yeah, <laughs> um, great question. Again, um, you know, it's it sounds kind of uh, maybe mundane, but but back in the day, I worked in cost containment and doing a lot of different programs in in trying to control healthcare costs. And I think the thing that I learned most was that data analytics really matter. That the understanding the data, interpreting it understanding what programs might be able to be implemented in order to control those healthcare costs or to respond to the data was really, I think, one of the most eye-opening things. And, and as you know, at Hopkins, it's very quantitative. And, and so I, I had a pretty good background in that and, and felt like that was the thing that kind of most surprised me, how important data-driven decision-making really is. That's neat. Uh, and I know we're going to talk more about that uh, in your, your current role as well. So you you left um, the managed care you know, uh, HMO side and moved to Cherokee in 1988 as an administrator. After about 10 years with the company, in 1998, you were promoted to chief operating officer. And you've recently transitioned to chief strategy officer and national training director. So before we kind of get into your specific roles, uh, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about Cherokee. And particular, and so as I was doing the research for, for, the, for the interview, I found one of your presentations online. And in it, you said something to the effect of um, the mission of Cherokee is to go where the grass is brownest, which I, I, I love that line. I know that's not the actual like formal mission, but I, uh, but, but I thought it was an interesting expression. So what does that mean? And why is that relevant to Cherokee? We started off as a community mental health center in kind of rural Appalachia, about an hour northeast of uh, Knoxville and Knoxville, Tennessee. And so we were just a tiny little community mental health center. And we were mostly servicing, serving uh, individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, you know, bipolar illness, schizophrenia, major depression, you know, that sort of thing, a lot of case management. And strategically, we saw back in the day that we really needed to retool a little bit and we needed to um, move into primary care. Um, at the, um, that's where a lot of our patients were really needed service uh, and they needed care and there was not a lot available. And so uh, uh, in the early 80s, Cherokee branched out into primary care. And then in about 2000, uh, we discovered that the federal government actually will pay grants to organizations to do this kind of work. We were 
who knew, you know? And so uh, we became a priority qualified health center. So we have kind of a unique perspective as a community mental health center and then moving into becoming a, a federally qualified health center later in our history. So the um, that's, that's kind of our early days. As far as the mission of uh, going where the grass is brownest, the, um, you know, there are so many people that have such high needs, you know, uh, both mental health needs and primary care needs, medical needs. And so as we looked around, uh, we wanted to go where there was the greatest need uh, for uh, those services, dental services too, I forgot to mention that. And so we um, uh, had a, a mission and where we, uh, I started with Cherokee, like you said, in 88. And, and at the time, I'm, don't hold me to this, but I think we maybe had about 90 or 100 employees at the time, roughly. Mm-hmm. We have about 715 employees yeah. now. At the time, we had about four locations. Now we have 23 and then 23 telemedicine locations in addition to those. And so, and we uh, now are expanded across the entire state, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Memphis. So we've just looked at the data again and said, where's where's the need? Where, where are people really needing care? And that's where we want to go. What's really cool is the organizational values are from our board of directors to our CEO to leadership team to really our employees – this is just what we're here for, what we're all about. And it's, so it, it's just an enjoyable experience because having come you know, out of the Vista world and, and then into this world, those values of, of service and compassion and quality, excellence uh, just really resonated. So you used a couple of, of um, terms. We've, we've, you mentioned that Cherokee started as a community mental health center. It then expanded to become a federally qualified health center. Can you kind of explain what those two health centers are and what that, you know, they have a technical meaning in the policy language? Yeah, the, the, the community mental health centers, uh, the mental health piece, really is run by the state of Tennessee. And you may recall, based on your health policy history, that that uh, mental health was a federal program as well, just like the uh, federally qualified health centers. But in Reagan's administration, I believe it was, he decided to block grant the mental health uh, and said, really, the, the feds really don't have too much business to be in that. You know, they don't have too much reason to be in the mental health delivery side of things. They're still NASA, of course. But, but uh, there was this block grant to, this, to each of the states and so each state was required to come up with their own mental health system. And that's why you have 50 different, you know, mental health systems. And you have a lot of challenges in terms of funding and fragmentation and, and so on. But at the same time, there was talk about grant, uh, excuse me, block granting the federally qualified health centers. And I believe by one vote, I'm not sure about it, but I think by one vote, it was decided that they would not block grant the medical side of things. And so on the, on the federally qualified health center side, that's still a funded program by HRSA. It's pretty strong. There's, uh, I believe, 1,300 FQHCs around the country right now. And uh, it usually provides medical services mental health services, dental services, all kinds of services like that. So the difference is CMHCs are state regulated, FQHCs are federal. Funding comes from the states for the CMHCs, of course, and from the feds, it comes, FQHCs comes from the feds. There are other differences too in terms of population. Usually they have the CMHCs deal with people who have very severe mental illnesses and the FQHCs are more preventive in terms of medical services as well as treatment. Is it unusual to have an organization that is has status as both of these kinds of programs? It, it is. I don't know how many there are, but I'd say probably, don't hold me to this number, but I'd say less than a dozen Okay. across, across the country. Yeah. I know because I've, I've I know up here in New Hampshire I, I know we have both. I was I'm not aware there may be one here, but I'm not aware of any that are 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 both have have both an organization that has status as both. So I, I thought that was an, a kind of unusual. 
I believe there's an organization there that's working towards it. Okay. And you were just up here visiting, which is how we met. So, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. might know. Um, no, right. Are there any challenges to managing an organization that has status as both? I, I think so. Uh, the In the CMHC world, you know, you're obligated under state regulations to perform certain you know, tasks and duties, and, and funding is somewhat more precarious. Under the federal side, there are regulations on that side as well. As an FQHC, you have to do quite a few things, and they come in and they'll audit you uh, every couple of three years or so. So you just sort of have two regulatory silos, if you will, and, and so that's challenging. But you know what? In terms of the day-to-day management, I don't really think it creates that much of a challenge because you know people come in and they have mental health needs and they have medical needs and dental needs and so on. And you're just treating the individuals and you're structuring a healthcare system around meeting those needs. And so I think that it just makes sense to treat the whole person. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a little bit. So from a management perspective, same population, almost the same conditions, and it just functionally and structurally the way to go, we believe. So you joined in, in 1988, and you were saying at that time there were four, you had four uh, clinics maybe? And was yes. at that point, had you ma- had the organization made the transition to being both a, a CMHC and a FQHC, or were you, or, or was that something that happened after you joined? That happened about 12 years after I joined. Okay. Okay. So, so when you first joined, it was just a CMHC? Yes. Okay. We, we, we had some primary care offices that we were managing. Um, in, the, in the early 80s, what happened is, is that uh, two physicians in one of the counties, uh, primary care physicians in, in Appalachian County, decided that they were going to retire. And uh, the community was very concerned because there were no other resources. Um, and so uh, they talked with our CEO, Dennis Freeman, and uh, asked if they would consider, since we were there for mental health, they said, why don't you do primary care as well? And so uh, Dr. Freeman, I wasn't here at the time, early 80s, uh, but he went ahead and uh, opened up a little clinic, bought some land, um, hired a National Health Service Corps doc, hired the staff, and we were a great success clinically, providing a, a whole lot of excellent care to people that needed it, but we were a financial disaster. We had no idea how to code for primary care, how to collect for primary care visits. Uh, we didn't have a, a functional record system really that was integrated and it was just very challenging and you, you just kind of learn over time, don't do this, do this. You know? Okay. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of scars, but uh, we finally figured it out a little bit and, and moved forward from there. Wow. So I mean, you've grown from uh, four clinics in the time that, you know, that you, when you joined to now, you were saying 20, I believe it was 26. Is it 26 locations? 23, 23. bricks and mortar locations. Okay. And then we also have. You also have 23 telemedicine locations. I mean, that's a huge amount of growth in in the time you've been there. What was that like, uh, kind of growing with the organization, helping it grow, making those decisions strategically as to where to place the new growth? Yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, It still is wonderful. Uh, I've been here now 30 years, and every day it's different. And uh, I like that. I like different, you know, challenges and it's just so much fun. We have a wonderful team of people. Uh, uh, they're just committed to each other and to the uh, patients that we have the privilege of serving. And so it's it's just really a lot of fun. Uh, I I get bored easily, and so I don't. I would not want to just have four locations. You know, we just wanted to expand, and and it, it's fun setting those up, hiring the staff, uh, building the team, and it's just very very exciting. Now, your actual uh, mission, based on your 990, and maybe you use a different one but uh, uh, on a day-to-day basis, but according to your 990, it was to improve the quality of life for our patients through the blending of primary care, behavioral health, and prevention services. Is that what you actually use? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So 
so I mean, so this makes sense based on your your historical blend, literal blending of two, you know, primary care and 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 um, mental health. But that's not, I mean, that's kind of like a buzzword now. You guys were ahead of that by a couple of decades. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, this idea of of integrating behavioral health into primary care is you know, something that most organizations are just kind of waking up to now. Can you talk a little bit about integrated care, which you you talk a lot about in your organization. What does that mean for your organization? What it means for our organization is, is that we have structured a healthcare system in a way that treats the whole person. So if somebody uh, has a, if they're depressed or anxious about something or uh, what have you, substance abuse issues, uh, they can come to Cherokee. And conversely, if, if they uh, have diabetes or hypertension or other kinds of medical needs, the flu, you know, acute, they can come to Cherokee as well. When somebody walks through our door, though, if they're walking through the mental health door, that's the reason that they called us and wanted an appointment and such, we're going to check out their medical needs and ask questions about that, screening about that. And if somebody comes through the primary care door for their, their diabetes or whatever, we will also do screenings for mental health issues or substance abuse issues. So we, we try to structure it in a way that we're treating the whole person because, you know, most people struggle with a variety of illnesses and, and challenges in their personal lives and so on. So that's why we do that. And, and it's important that we, we think it's important that we identify the needs for the, for the entire person. But, but if I could take a second, you didn't ask this question, but you hinted at it a little bit, was how, how we got started in this in the first place. And it's a sort of an interesting story, and I'll just share that with you very quickly. Our CEO uh, is a psychologist, and he worked at a community mental health center here in Appalachia. He graduated from the University of Tennessee and then went to work for a local community mental health center. And back in the day, they wanted to do outreach into rural Appalachia, but they didn't have any offices. They didn't have any office space. And so his boss said to him, it said, uh, why don't you go out and just find some locations where you can see patients and then we'll, you know, look at building a building out there eventually. So he started looking at churches and he started looking at other places, you know, that he might, but he kind of stumbled across these primary care doctors that were out in rural Appalachia. And he went to them and he said, Hey, do, you have any, do your patients have any mental health needs? And they said, yeah, that's our number one need. And then he said, would you like a psychologist, sort of an itinerant psychologist to come by a couple times a week or a month or whatever and see your patients? And they said, absolutely, we, we, we would love that. So they started to do that. And the patients that were there, remember, this was, these were primary care offices. The patients that were there for primary care, they, they had other issues going on. And he started seeing them in primary care. And they really liked having this primary care and behavioral health under one roof. And he found that it was very helpful to the primary care provider for him to inform them about certain things and vice versa, and, and they became a team. And then over a period of time, these patients started you know, seeing him at, the, at those primary care offices, but the community mental health center finally built a building. And uh, Dr. Freeman said, uh, to his patients that he'd been seeing in primary care, hey, we now have a building. You can come to our building and be seen. And none of the patients wanted to do that. Oh. They said, we're, we're very comfortable seeing you in primary care, but we don't want to go to a mental health center. And so that's, uh, there's a lot of stigma, of course, and, you know, an extra trip. And, and they, were, they, they trusted their primary care provider. And so the seed of integration was really planted in those early days of an itinerant psychologist wandering around Appalachia uh, trying to see patients in primary care offices. Well, that's a neat, I mean, that's a really neat uh, uh, story. Yet you still did, you did in fact build this, um, this facility. So at what point did you actually, you said, you know, it was some years after you actually joined the organization that you actually integrated the, the primary care. Yeah, we, we were kind of co-location before, okay. and that was, that's an important distinction. 
with co-location, you have psychologists or social workers. You can use other disciplines, but that's what we use, working kind of parallel with the primary right. care provider. But it's kind of a written referral, you know, from the primary care. The person's scheduled to come back at a different time and have care. And the problem that we ran into with that model of co-location was that mental health providers' schedules just got full. And then the primary care provider was trying to make referrals to them, and they couldn't get them in. They had, meet, they had met their caseload of X number of patients. And so the only way to continue with that co-location model is to constantly add more behavioral health staff okay. to accept that increase. And as you know, with in primary care, the volume is so much greater than in behavioral health. So it just was not working for us very well because we didn't have the kind of access that we needed or wanted. And so we said, well, what if we take that psychologist or social worker and embed them in primary care and instead of making a formal written referral and everything, just have them, the primary care provider, step out of the office and get a hold of the behaviorist and say, hey, I've got Mrs. Smith in room two. She's got diabetes, and but she's very depressed about it. Um, there, things are not working out well for her. Could you go in in real time? Could you go in and see if you could help her? And so that's what that's what we started to do. And over time, we gradually worked out the bugs and scheduling and uh, all of the infrastructure needed to do integration where it's more of a team-based care with the primary care provider and the behaviorist working together in primary care. And you, you actually have some office layouts that you show in a, in a presentation that I'm gonna, I'll post to the show notes here that talk about how you actually have that laid out in some of your clinics. I yeah. So and this yeah. idea of co-location versus integration. So when did that actually like take hold? Was it, was, was your kind of your, 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 CEO, when he was an itinerant psychologist, was he operating in a more integrated manner because of his, or, or did he still find that he was kind of doing the co-location thing? I think he was doing more co-location. Okay. Uh, there were times probably that uh, the uh, primary care provider may have asked for his help in real time, but uh, I think it was probably for the most part more co-location. Okay. And, and so... In your model now, you were just talking about you had worked through the bugs. You have, along with your primary care, you have a model of of staffing where you have BHC, so a behavioral health clinician. You have we, we call them behavioral consultants because they're consultants, consulting to the primary provider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have so you have uh, in, in your model you have behavioral health consultants. As, and, and you have a, a ratio of one, one behavioral health consultant to every four PCPs on the adult side, one behavioral health consultant to every three pediatricians. So a BHC, yeah. what skill level are we talking about for, for this, this person? What, what the, uh, the BHC does is, is they are going right into the exam rooms. It's about 80% of the time, maybe 90% of the time they're in the exam rooms. The layout that you're going to post has... And a, an embedded office in primary care because proximity is so important in this model. If the primary care provider has to go to looking around for that behavior, if they're not available, doors closed, other kinds of things, they're just not going to use them. Now, they don't have time. And so the BHC has to be readily available, and that's why that office layout is the way it is because it just makes them much closer to the action uh, if there's not an ideal office like you were talking about, um, we'll use a BHC to perch uh, at a nurse's station or perch somewhere visible to the primary care provider so that they're used more frequently. And the kinds of things that a BHC will do is often very similar to what they would do in a specialty kind of role, but qualitatively different, motivational interviewing, other kinds of skills that they would learn, but it's applied in a primary care setting instead. It's not therapy. A lot of people think, oh, you're just doing, you know, therapy shorter in primary care. 
And it's really not that. It's a qualitatively different service. For example, we had a uh, patient who was very depressed and he was very overweight and was eating ice cream in bed all day long. And that was what he wanted to do. His diabetes was out of control. His blood sugar was out of control. The primary care doctor didn't know what to do with him anymore. And so he called in one of our behavioral health consultants and said, look, I need your help with this patient. He's eating ice cream in bed all day long and I'm just struggling trying to get his blood sugar under control. So the BHC went in and you know this patient's pretty smart. He knew that the, that the BHC was gonna say, hey, stop eating so much ice cream. He this is just killing you, right? That's what he expected them to say, right? Instead, the BHC said, so you like eating ice cream in bed, huh? And the guy said, yeah, I love it. That's you know what I really enjoy. And he was not ready to change that behavior. So she said, well, what if you eat all the ice cream that you want? And he's now thinking, wow, this is a good deal. You know, I like this idea, but you can't eat it in bed anymore. You don't have to eat it in the living room. And so he said, yeah, I can do that. It's a small step. And then after a couple of weeks, she said, how's it going? It's going fine. You're eating the ice cream in the, in the living room now, right? He said, yep. And she said, how about if you can eat ice cream all you want, but it's got to be on the front porch? And he said, oh, okay, I can do that. And so he started eating his ice cream on the front porch. But what happened when he was on the front porch, do you think? What happened was... He saw his neighbors. He started having more social interaction. His depression started getting a little bit less. On his own, he decided that he was going to walk to the mailbox each day and get his mail. And so he's getting more, a little bit more exercise. And those were small steps that he could take to help control his intake of sugar. And eventually, his hemoglobin A1C got within a controlled level. Wow. Didn't happen, didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, he lost significant weight and, you know, all those kinds of things. But it, it's just a very patient, small steps that a behaviorist knows how to do those kinds of things. And, and it's just not therapy, like I was saying. They weren't going to him and saying, well, why are you eating all this ice cream in bed? Uh, tell me about your childhood and tell right. me about other kinds of things. It's not that. And that is why these folks, the BHCs, can do what they do in such a quick, short period of time. So it's really, focused on, it's really focused on behaviors that complement the primary care need, not so much. Exactly. They won't go into a session uh, just like on a fishing expedition. Very rarely would that happen. What will happen is it's very targeted the primary care provider will say, I need your help with this person's anxiety, or I need your help with this person's depression, or I need your help with this person's diabetes. And so it's a very targeted request that the primary care provider is asking for help with. The BHC's role is twofold. One is to lighten the load for the primary care provider, help them, give them those critical behavioral health resources that usually are not available in real time, certainly, or even sometimes on a referral basis. And the second is to uh, support the patient and whatever the patient's needs are. And so those are the two, quote, audiences, if you will, for the BHC. Well, that's interesting. So it's, it is not therapy. It is not mental health care or behavioral health care per se in the, in the sense of, of it being therapy. It's more to support the, the, the medical outcome. Where where a exactly. mental health issue perhaps or a behavioral health issue is is interfering, that, that's really an interesting model. Are, uh, so I started to ask earlier, what level of training do your BHCs have? Formal training? Are they are they social? Are they, you know, uh, social workers or, or what's their kind of background? Uh, a lot of different people with different disciplines can do this kind of work, but what we use are uh, licensed clinical social workers and um, PhD level psychologists. Okay. We have about 15 BHCs right now, and I believe 13 of them are PhDs and two are LCSWs. And the reason for that staffing is that 
years ago, we could not find well-trained VHCs. It was new. It was different. The schools were, you know, basically training more of a specialist kind of provider, which is fine. There's a need for that. But we needed folks who really got integration and understood it. So we started an APA, in American Psychological Association, internship program. And so we started to train four interns a year now. We're up to five. And these folks come to us and they learn integration uh, in the trenches, you know, tremendous didactic portion, tremendous um, seeing patients, clinical. Uh, so it's just a really, really sought after internship. I believe, don't hold me to these numbers, but I believe uh, we have 150 to 200 applications for those five slots. Wow. So it's pretty competitive to get into. But the reason we have so many PhDs is because we kind of created this pipeline. Our, our, our initial fantasy was that we were going to train all these DHCs and they were going to go all over the country to all these FQHCs and save the world and all that. But everybody stays <laughs> and, and uh, they really like being here and staying here. And, and so we've, we've retained probably 75% at least of the folks that we've trained. Wow, uh, that's great. I, so I noted that you have a different staffing ratio for pediatrics. Why is that? It's a little bit more intense because you're working with kids, you're working with families, sometimes you're working with teachers or principals. There's there's other uh, uh, other people in the child's life. Okay. And um, you just need more time. Those calls to do that work. Yeah. Now the services that you that Cherokee offers are pretty wide ranging. You've got adult and primary primary care and behavioral health care, uh, child and adolescent care, women's services, addiction services, um, social services, dental services. I think dental services is an interesting point. Is that a common? I think I've seen that up here. Is that a is that a common thing to see in an FQHC? Is dental? It, it is yes, and. Uh, we have a very small dental program here, just a, a couple of dentists, but some FQHCs, especially in states where Medicaid pays for adult dental, they might have, you know, 20 operatories and, and uh, uh, a large number of dentists and, and hygienists and so on. Uh, dental care is just so important to somebody's overall health care. And so uh, a lot of FQHCs do a, a wonderful job with dental. Uh, how important is dental to your to Cherokee's mission, you think? How does it integrate into the overall picture? It, it's, it's really important, um, but we have a, a financial challenge, a barrier, in that Medicaid in Tennessee does not pay for adult dental services. And so uh, at FQHCs, we have a sliding fee scale and we'll slide down to X dollars uh, here at Cherokee. It's twenty dollars, and so um, we usually end up losing quite a bit of money on the dental side, and that's fine uh, in a limited kind of way. But for us to expand dramatically to have like ten dentists, uh, it would really be economically challenging for us to do that. Uh, but it it is really an important part of somebody's overall health care. Now, you also offer addiction services, and as I'm sure you know, you know, New Hampshire is kind of ground zero for the opioid crisis. I imagine this challenges in, in areas where you take, take care of uh, your patients as well. Um, how much of a, how significant is your addiction services um, to your overall practice? I would take a little bit of issue with you, Mark, that you're ground zero for the opioid today. You are way up there, but I think Tennessee but that might be a challenge. Might challenge okay. you with All right. that. I'm willing to go with that. <laughs> the, uh, it's just really, really challenging all over the country. Yep. Really, it is. But the it, it's really critically important for for our population. The we were just blessed a couple of years ago to be able to hire an addictionologist. This person is board certified in family medicine and then went back and got his board certification in addiction medicine. And so he is just a godsend and, and uh, really knows the medications, really understands the 
the way addiction works in people and the, you know, the disease that it is. And, and so he basically, we said to him, Mark, his name is Mark too, not oh, you, but okay. Mark, just, just, just make it happen. What resources do you need to make this happen? Oh, I need this, 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 and this, you know, space and staff and such. And so he just kind of said, go for it. And that's kind of the way we do things here at Cherokee. We have another uh, motto, you know, like you said, go where the grass is brownest. The other one is do the right thing and the money will follow. We'll figure out how to, how to pay for it later. But we now have a very large addiction medicine program. We do these training academies, as you know, you, you were in one of those that uh, I spoke at and, and we do the same thing, an intense two day addiction medicine uh, training academy as well. So that's again, part of just the need that's out there. So speaking of, of the money following, I, I wanted to just talk briefly about, um, you know, you mentioned um, uh, uh, you know, grants uh, earlier. So I was looking at your 990. It looks like in 2017, you had about $65 million in revenues. Of that, $17 million was grants. That's kind of an unusual, I mean, so that's almost a quarter of your funding. Is that about right? Is that, uh, do I have those numbers about right? That's about right, yes. So what's unique about, I mean, we're not going to see that at a hospital, for example, a community hospital. Um, so FQHCs typically have a large grant as, or large grants as part of their, of their funding. How does that work and kind of uh, how does that affect the way you deliver care? Yeah, it really, uh, as an FQHC, the federal government does give us those grant dollars and then we're expected to earn those grants with the number of services that we promise to deliver. And so that's part of that grant process. We might say, they might say, we'll give you X dollars, but for that, we want 10,000 patient visits or, or something to that effect. Or we want, you know, 3,000 unique new users of your services. And so that's usually the way that works. The other requirement that with an FQHC, a couple of others, is that we are required to have a sliding fee scale. So uh, the services for the day might be $200, but we'll, based on family size and income, we'll slide that down to $20, let's say. So we write off that $180. And so that really is the money that the grant is used for, uh, for all of that, what a hospital might call charity care. So that helps a lot. And then another revenue source that's unique for FQHCs is that we get what's called prospective payment system, PPS dollars. And what that is, is based on your costs, the state of Tennessee Medicaid program will pay us our, our PPS rate of X dollars per visit, regardless of what happens in that visit. And uh, so that really helps with our revenue as well. And another thing it occurred to me, Mark, uh, that uh, 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 might be of interest to your um, audience is that at an FQHC, uh, we're required, all the FQHCs are required to have at least 50% of their board members to be users, to be patients. And so technically, our patients govern us. And and we think that that's really cool because, of course, they have the incentive to make sure that we survive and do well and provide access to care and, and so on and so forth. So that's really a cool part of being an FQHC. You mentioned earlier in telemedicine that you had 23, a, a matching number of telemedicine clinics. We're, we're putting together a telemedicine center here at, at the University of New Hampshire, and so this is a hot topic with us here at the faculty talking about how we can uh, help with that. So I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about how you have used telemedicine. So with 23 clinics, you, you must have cracked the code a bit on how to use them. So what, what is a telemedicine yeah. clinic, and how do you use it? Yeah. Let me give you a little background because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. You've heard of the Great Smoky Mountains, of course, and there's a lot of tourism there, a lot of hotels, a lot of uh, restaurants, and so on. And there's a school district over there 
that basically serves these children of a lot of the hotel workers and restaurant workers and people dependent on the tourism industry. And most of these people don't get time off to take their, their children to the doctor. They lose income if they, you know, lose work and hours and so on. And so many times, not always, but many times, they were bringing their kids to school sick. And so the teachers and the principals and everything had these children, and, and uh, they just, it was just a challenge for them. So they approached Cherokee a number of years ago and said, we would like you to put a doctor or a nurse practitioner in every one of our 23 schools. And we said, well, that's great. What's the smallest school that you have? And they said, well, it's about two or 300 students. And we said, well, gee, that's not, not enough volume to make it work for a full-time person to be there. And so uh, we can't do that at the smallest. We could do it at the bigger schools, but not the smaller ones. And they said, no, we want it to be across the board. We want all of our schools to be able to be having access to um, a medical provider. And we said, well, what about using telemedicine? And if we just have two nurse practitioners centrally located at Cherokee, and we beam them out to those 23 schools, and your school nurse, then uh, when they get a child coming to them because the child is sick, they would then say, ah, you need to see a nurse practitioner or doctor. And they just hook them up in real time right there. And they turn on the camera. They turn on the polycom equipment that we use. And they said, well, that would be great. And also what's interesting in Tennessee is the T1 lines connect all the schools. And so we could do this all throughout Appalachia if we wanted to. We're just in, in this one county. But they're all school-based clinics, and a child comes to the school nurse because they're not feeling well, and they find out that, uh, I'll just use an example of maybe uh, there's an ear problem. And so we have all the scopes and equipment that I'm sure you're familiar with and primary care so that uh, we have a large screen TV that the child can actually see on the large screen TV the inside of their ear, the inside of their mouth, the inside of their eyes and nose, and all the scope work that happens, you know, we can take pictures of rashes uh, up close and put it into the child's electronic record. So uh, the children are fascinated by, you know, their own anatomy, you know, they're being able to see inside their ears and as nose throat. And so we kind of have this fantasy that, that we're, we're uh, planting seeds for a whole new generation of healthcare providers and, uh, we, we have uh, the information for the child, their insurance information, Medicaid information, whatever. We send backpack uh, information home with them at the beginning of the year. Parents fill it out. They enroll the child. They give us their pharmacy information. We have billing arrangements if there's any kind of billing that needs to occur. And so everything just is a kind of a well-oiled machine so that when Johnny, who's in third grade, comes in for you know, a sore throat, we have everything at our fingertips. And then we say to Johnny, here, we're going to call in some medicine to, you know, Walgreens, CVS or whatever. And your mom's going to pick it up or your dad. And you're going to take that for two weeks. And you're going to come back and we're going to look in your throat again. And that redness is going to be gone. And so they can't wait to come back and, and see uh, their throat again. And so that, it's, just a, it's just a fun, exciting kind of opportunity to work with kids. So we also have a lot of psychiatry, telemedicine. As you know, the, the mean age for psychiatrists in the country, I believe, is in the high 50s. And so they're looking at possible retirement soon, and a lot of residency pro, uh, slots are going unfilled. And so there's just not enough psychiatrists here, at least in East Tennessee. And so we beam our psychiatrists here out into uh, different communities where we have offices. And so instead of that psychiatrist taking an hour or two to drive out into the country, they can just come to a central office and we can then be in them out. The other thing that too is a little unique, you might want to think about this as you look at, at your program. We want the medical providers on our side to look just like the folks on the evening news. That means, I mean, good lighting, uh, good audio, 
Um, we have studio quality lights and such for these people because what was happening, we kind of learned the hard way, you know, the scars working out the bugs. But what happened is if you have, I can see you on the screen and you have fluorescent lights over top of your head right, right. and those lights cast a shadow underneath your eyes. And so a, an eight-year-old, seven-year-old child sees you and you might seem kind of nice, but also they might not be able to see you so well and they are kind of scared that this kind of person that looks with these dark eyes and you know shadows and everything and and so we want it to look like the evening news so that it's more welcoming for especially children nice. but the other thing too that's interesting mark is that we've had some physicians here who have tennessee licenses but they live in other states and they're able to beam in our medical director Dr. Wallace lives in Kentucky, but she has a Tennessee license. And so she just telecommutes every day from her den and sees patients here. She comes in on occasion to see those some patients that don't want to do the telemedicine. But probably, I would guess, 80%, 90% of her patients are all done via telemedicine. And so it really helps with recruitment and retention. Uh, we've had psychiatrists being in from Georgia, from Tennessee, from uh, uh, Kentucky, other places. Does Tennessee, so I know this is this is an issue we've talked a little bit about from a policy side, and you just said about, you were talking about the, your your chief medical officer lives in Kentucky but has a Tennessee license. So this reciprocity question, does Tennessee have any special arrangements with other states where, where maybe they acknowledge a different license, or is that still a problem where you really have to find somebody who has a Tennessee license? It's the latter. Yeah, what we've done is, is they, they have to have a Tennessee license. Uh, if they don't have a Tennessee license, but they're licensed in Kentucky or a contiguous state, I don't, be, I don't believe that that uh, reciprocity occurs. I think you have to have a Tennessee license. Yeah. Okay. I just, so we were talking earlier about, uh, you've talked a couple of times about using metrics, using data. And so one of the things that I thought was really cool about your presentation was you talked about a biopsychosocial assessment, a BPSA that, that you use to look at your population. So could you tell, talk a little bit about your, this, the BPSA and, and how that's used, how you guys developed it and how you use it? And just for ease of rolling off the tongue, we call it the BIPSA. The BIPSA, and, all right. Uh, and so- yeah, so instead of calling it BPSA, we just call it BIPSA. And, um, you know, what happened there was that we are a pretty large provider. We have about 78,611 patients last year that we saw and 400 plus thousand patient visits. And so uh, we're the largest FQHC in Tennessee. And, and we um, were working with these managed care companies and they wanted to work out these value based contracts with us. And they wanted to assign us 10,000 patients or 12,000 patients and said, okay, this Blue Cross, these are our members. We, they need primary care providers. We'll contract with Cherokee. You provide the care that they need for these 12,000 people. We're going to assign those to you. And so uh, we did that. With, we have three managed care organizations in the state. One is Blue Cross, one is Amerigroup, and one is United Health Plan. And the, um, they're, they're really good people to work with. They, they really want to do the right thing. But it's hard sometimes in assigning a population to get that exactly right. So uh, what we learned is that you really do have to make sure that the population that's assigned to you is truly yours. And that's a whole other story. But what we did is we were, we were faced with this problem that we were suddenly assigned, I'll say, 12,000 patients. And we were thinking, okay, who are these people? What are their medical problems? What are their behavioral health problems? How do we access them? Are they patients of ours? Or are they not? And so on and so forth. So we were being asked to manage a population that we really didn't understand. We didn't understand their complexity and what was driving those healthcare costs. So anyway, the, the, the genesis of the BIPSA was that who are these people and how complex are their needs? And how do we get that data, that information, to our providers so that they can act on it? That was That's basically the questions that we had. So we said, you know, if somebody has diabetes and they have 
hypertension and they have, maybe they're recovering from cancer, but they have medical diagnoses, then that there are different relative weights for those different diagnoses. But then we also know that if they have psychological diagnoses in addition to their medical diagnosis, let's say they have, they have diabetes, like I just said, but they also have depression. Those healthcare costs and the complexity of care does not increase linearly, it increases exponentially. And so all the research shows that, all the data shows that. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to develop an algorithm that showed, okay, this is their medical diagnoses and these are their psychological diagnoses. And so that's part of the algorithm. But then we also know being an FQHC, and, and you know this, you're not an FQHC, but everybody knows this, they're the social determinants of health really drive complexity and healthcare costs. So if somebody has a medical diagnosis, namely, let's say diabetes, we'll use, we're using that as an example, and they're depressed, and they don't have access to good housing, or they don't have the ability to get their prescriptions, or they speak English as a second language or whatever it might be, that makes them even more complex. And so the algorithm was written with weighted medical diagnoses, weighted psychological diagnoses, and weighted social determinants of health. And then being the brilliant mathematicians that we are, we just added them up, you know? So it was not, it was not very complex after that. The weightings were done internally. This is basically a homegrown system. And uh, we just went to our medical director uh, for the medical diagnoses and said, you know, if, uh, if the standard is 1.0, how serious is the flu or how serious is diabetes uncontrolled or the different diagnosis codes? And then we went to our behaviorist and said, you know, could you weight the behavioral diagnoses for us? And then we just had a team come up with a social determinant. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting in this model is that the social determinants, we often don't know that because they've never come in. They're assigned to us. They're one of the 12,000 people, but the people that actually are coming in where we can actually get the data might only be 6,000 people from Blue Cross or Mayor Group or United. So there are 6,000 people that we have no idea who they are or what their medical complexities are, but because of this contract, we're still at risk for them. And so the, uh, the challenge for us was to sort of come up with a proxy for the social determinants. And what we ended up doing was we used zip code because zip code trumps genetic code every day of the week. And so that's what we did. And we always had the zip code for these people because we, we had an address, at least the latest address. And the other part of this equation was we needed the claims data for these people because if they weren't coming to see us, but they were, they were increasing our costs and affecting our quality metrics, they were going somewhere. It might have been to the emergency room. It might have been to another provider or what have you. So in all of our value-based contracting deals, we negotiate for claims data. And we really, really go to the mat for claims data. Sometimes it comes in great. Sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's a challenge, but that is really what drives those HEDIS measures. If you think HEDIS, you think claims, right? So those HEDIS metrics that we're accountable for come from claims. And we wanted to have those claims so that we could see where we are and, and what we can do better. We don't want necessarily claims that are 90 days, 120 days, 180 days old. And so we also have data warehouse, a health information exchange. And that's been an important part of this equation as well, because when those patients that are assigned to us go to a provider, University of Tennessee Medical Center, emergency room, something like that, um, through that health information exchange, we get notified that they're in the hospital or they're in the emergency room. And then that goes right into our electronic health record, which helps us then be able to act on that. So every patient that comes in has a BIPSA score. And um, during our daily huddles, uh, uh, let's say, Mark, you come in and your BIPSA score is uh, 49. 
the mean of all of our patients is about five. Okay. So that means you're pretty thick. There's something going on with Mark and say mine is a 10. So what they're going to do in that huddle is they're going to say, oh, Mark's coming in and we need to pull out all the stops. We need to make sure what's going on here. We need to fill the gaps in care. We need to uh, make sure that his IPSA needs are met. And Joel, he's, he's, he's okay. We don't have to spend so much time with him. Does that trigger any sort of preemptive review or preemptive kind of, hey, we'd like you to come in? You, Mark, you've got a 47. We'd, we'd, we'd like to see you. you don't, we're not going to wait for you to show up. <laughs> absolutely. That's part of the treatment plan. Yeah, okay. absolutely. You're right. And then part of the equation, too, is, is to have community health coordinators who go out to the homes. The care is not always within the four walls, right? You know, okay. people live outside. Right. And so they, uh, we, we have about 40 community health coordinators that go to the homes and check up on patients, get them in for care as needed. We have other staff, care managers and so on that, that are doing the same thing in the clinics. So it's just kind of building these resources around the needs of the patients. That, that's, that's the key. And when I was talking about those community health coordinators, this is just a small example of how important these people are. They're usually bachelor's level people maybe with a degree in social work or psychology, they are probably doing this job before going back and getting graduate uh, degree in, in, in those disciplines. But we had a patient whose diabetes was way out of control all the time, different person than the other person. And so the primary care provider said, could, you send, could, could we send somebody to their home and see what's going on? So the uh, community health coordinator went to the patient's home and the primary care provider had made a big mistake with this patient's care. The patient said, doc, I'll do everything you want. I'll eat right, I'll exercise, I'll do whatever you want, but I have to have my daily Coca-Cola. That's all I'm asking. And the doc said, fine, you know, you can have your Coke, but you gotta do everything else. But the diabetes was still not under control. And so when when the community health coordinator went to the patient's home, they said, you know, could we just kind of look in your pantry? Would that be okay? And they said, fine. They opened up the doors. Everything was a carbohydrate, you know, which is challenging. And just during the conversation that they were having during the visit, the patient said, would you mind if I got a, my Coke? My doctor said I could have it. And the, the community health coordinator said, fine, that's fine. And she was expecting the patient to come out with a two liter Coke, you know, that that was her daily Coke, right? No, it was a regular size can of Coke. And she poured it into this glass and the community health coordinator is watching this and she walks over to the sugar bowl. (laughs) I am not making this up, Mark. I'm not making this up. She walks over to the sugar bowl and she puts a teaspoon of sugar in her Coca-Cola and stirs it. Puts in another teaspoon. Puts in another teaspoon. Third teaspoons of sugar were going into her regular sugar Coca-Cola and suddenly we had a clue why her diabetes wasn't quite under control. So I guess what I'm saying is that with integrated care, it's not just one thing. It's not just embedding a behaviorist in primary care. That's really important, team-based care. But there are all these other pieces of the puzzle, the FIPSA, understanding you know, the complexity of your patients and the population assigned to you, getting community health resources in place to provide care outside the clinic walls, value-based contracts and deals to be able to pay for all this infrastructure that many times is not billable. So those are all parts of the puzzle. So your role now is um, you are the Chief Strategy Officer and National Training Director. Uh, before that, you served as 25 years as the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, can you describe your role as what does it mean to be a chief operating officer in, in, in Cherokee? Um, how did that evolve? And then what's your role now? What, what does it mean to be the chief strategy officer? Right. Um, with the chief operating officer, I, I think of it as just getting everything in place so that the trains run on time. Uh, just making sure that we have the resources, the staff, the, the vision, the locations, the electronic health record, everything in place so that our employees can can just do an excellent job day in and day out. Um, I, I kind of 
ascribe to the whole leader, uh, servant leadership model. So but I believe my job as a CLO is, is to serve our employees and kind of model that and then have them serve our patients. And so that's kind of the way you know, we think of things here. The, the COO is, is a very dynamic job. Everything is, you know, you, you, you arrive at work and um, 12 hours later, you can't believe the time has gone. You know, it's just like everything's happening. You know, it's a very fast-paced, exciting, inspiring kind of a work. The chief strategy officer, though, is much more pensive. <laughs> you know, I'm, we're, I'm not doing the kinds of operational things, making the staffing decisions and doing all the, that kind of work. It's much more looking at, well, where do we need to be in, you know, a couple of years? Are we getting there? What's our plan look like? How do we make sure that we accomplish our mission. What new business opportunities are out there? Maybe we could merge with another FQHC, or maybe we could buy a practice. Maybe we could you know, acquire other kinds of services that might help our patients. Those kinds of things are part of the chief strategy officer's role. It's working with our leadership team to um, overcome any kinds of issues. So there's a consultative role if you look at chief strategy officers across the country, a lot of times they came out of operations and a big part of their job is, is to consult with them because they know that uh, world and uh, they can work on it. But they're kind of outside, if you will, the operations uh, organizational structure. And so they're able to consult and, and provide support that way. And then what's really cool, too, about my job is, is that years ago we were having all these people come to Cherokee wanting to have tours, wanting to learn about integration. And our CEO is spending 70% of his time giving tours. And so uh, he said, you know, enough already. And saw sort of a, an opportunity to develop these training academies. And so what these are, are usually two-day academies, one in addiction medicine, like we were just talking about, one pediatric integrated care, two pediatric integrated care a detailed behavioral health consultant training academy because a lot of people struggle with, you know, what do they do and what's that look like? So it's a really nuts and bolts. And then the uh, a general training academy that shows what this is, how it works, everything from scheduling and, and operations to the clinical model and communications and culture and so on. So we have those four training academies in place. And and like I was saying, an interesting part of my job is to work on those trainings around the country. I was up in New Hampshire, as you know, and kind of taking that show on the road in a way and, and sort of share this information in different parts of the country. Uh, I've been to Alaska eight times. Uh, there's a lot of interest in integrated care up there because there are so few resources and primary care patients and physicians need uh, and nurse practitioners need integration in order to, to uh, just provide access to care all over the country. I think we've been now in 49 states. Wow. And, and I think one of the Dakotas is the only one that we've not been in. <laughs> Let's just close on a couple of thoughts about leadership. So you said you were, you thought of yourself as a, a servant leader. What makes a good, what makes a good leader in your experience? <laughs> well, that's, it's so tough to, to answer that. I, you know, I've wondered that myself. Uh, I think, though, it's it's somebody who um, um, uh, cares a lot about the, the people he or she has the privilege of leading. I think it's the uh, you know that connection through communication, other kinds of things that that just help connect you with people. It's looking out for uh, other people's interests and needs and trying to meet those as best you can, having a vision and influencing people to accomplish that vision, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little vague, but the face of that, that influencing role, I think is really an important part of it. Just caring about people is, is so huge. We're doing strategic planning right now. And one of the tools that we use is, an, is a survey uh, employees and we asked our employees, you know, what are your strength? What's charity strengths and weaknesses? And so, and that's normal, right? SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunity, threats. But we said to them, if you were the boss, 
what would be the number one goal that you would set for Cherokee in the next three years? What do you think Cherokee should really do? And it was really, really interesting. The response was, if I was the boss, what I'd really want to do is I'd want to focus, not, you know, not surprisingly, but I'd want to focus on the employees and meeting their needs. Uh, because, you know, we're the resources that you need in order to provide high quality patient care. So I know that our strategic planning is going to be very, very patient focused, of course, but also very, very employee focused. And we'll be collecting a lot of data to be able to see that. So I think those are just some passing thoughts yeah. about what I think might make a good leader. When you when you go to hire a leader, so you're a you're in a senior level position for and you've been there for a long time. So when you look to hire a, 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 a manager that will work for you, what are you looking for? What kind of skills, yeah. traits, behaviors? Yeah, I think somebody who's kind of passionate about the underserved is somebody that we would really want on the team. That would be number one. You know, the, our mission, understanding integration is, is a big deal. Somebody who has, this sounds really, I don't know, uh, somebody that's kind of a small ego, and that's sometimes a, an interesting juxtaposition, but we're so team-oriented here at Cherokee that if somebody comes in and they have a big ego and, and it's all about them, they're not going to work out on this team at, at all. Uh, they're going to alienate the rest of the team, and, and it's probably not going to work out too well. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we can train skills, but we can't train personality. And so the um, it's important that, that a person's personality really meshes well with the other people on the team. It's interesting. We're, we're in the midst of that right now. It's interesting that you would ask, Mark, because our, our chief operating officer, the one that replaced me, uh, she was my right-hand person for 17 years, and we like to promote from within, and so we promoted her. And she had another opportunity as a CEO at another health center. Oh, wow. And so we're actually looking for a new COO right now. And these are exactly the kinds of questions that we're grappling with. You know, what do we want with this person? Well, you know, what should he or she have in terms of the skill set and so on? But I think it comes down to mission, passion, uh, commitment to the underserved, and then to have, of course, some good leadership skills probably some good quantitative skills. I think that's an important piece of this. And those are it. Well, let me uh, put you on the spot for a second. So I, this is a question I like to ask, and you can pass on it. If as, you... As, if, as, if you as if you haven't already been putting <laughs> on the spot. Okay, that's fair. Um, but uh, so one of the questions I like to ask folks, and you can pass on this if you'd like, can you give an example of a difficult leadership lesson that you had to learn the hard way? So maybe something that you know, you made a mistake and you realized after the fact, okay, this, you know, I, I was looking at this wrong. And uh, what did you learn from that? Just, just one. <laughs> we, we can go with, we can go yeah, with yeah. just one for now. Right. right. I, I don't know if you ever heard this, uh, if somebody said it, that uh, he's a very humble person. And uh, the other person said, yeah, he's got a lot to be humble about. <laughs> um, and so I, I think I'm in that latter latter category. I have a lot to be humble about. Oh goodness, um, a situation. I think I, I'll give you this example. I, I I might have told you this before. I'm not sure, but part of my job as the chief operating officer was to recruit physicians. You know, they're just really scarce. They have many many job offers. There's a shortage across the country, and so my thinking was that these primary care physicians, we had, we had access to nurse practitioners, but I was specifically talking about MDs that we were meeting at the time, um, that their, their schedule is so important to them. And they want to control their schedule because it really, uh, uh, their quality of life depends on it really many times. And so uh, I would go to these docs and I'd say, uh, you know, we'd like you to come work for Cherokee and we really want you to be able to control your own schedule. And they would immediately be interested in that. Oh, really? These other companies aren't telling me that. Uh, that sounds interesting. I said, yeah, what, what would you like your schedule to look like? And some of them were general, but 
some of them were very specific. And they would say, well, I want my schedule to be, I'd like to do um, well child checks every Tuesday and Thursday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And I would like to do family medicine the rest of the time. I would also like my, uh, another person might say, I want to do minor surgeries Thursday mornings from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10.02 in the morning. You know, okay. very deep, you yeah. know, very detailed. So we would have all of these very detailed schedules. And then I said to these these schedulers who would set up the system to, to do that, to make that happen, I'd say, here's, here's what this doctor wants. He's coming on board. Make this happen. And they literally would have a manual that thick that would have all these different appointment types. My intentions were good in terms of wanting to recruit these providers, but I created such a complex scheduling system that the schedulers were constantly messing up the schedule. It was impossible to get the schedule right because the patient would call and said, I need a well child check. Oh, that's between eight and 10 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, oh no, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was Wednesdays and Fridays from four to five. I don't know. Right. And so they were just making mistakes. So then the primary care provider would get upset because they were, you know, the scheduling and wrong. And so then the schedulers finally came to me and said, Joel, you're just screwing up here. You're making this way too hard. We can't do this. We cannot implement what you want to do. And so I had to go back to these doctors and say, Dr. Smith, we have two choices. One, we can, can keep your schedule the way I promised, and I can guarantee you every day is going to be miserable. It's going to be messed up, and if you want a miserable existence, we'll just keep it. But if you want to, we, we can simplify the schedule that everybody's schedule is the same and consistent and we'll just have like five appointment types and then it'll be done correctly. So which of those two options do you want? And I'll be always said, I'd like my schedule to be right. And so that's what we did. And so my intentions were good, Mark, my intentions were good, but I screwed up and uh, I just too hard and too complex. And the key to, I think that was, to fixing that was that those schedulers, many of these people have high school degrees and so on, and they're not really high in the organization or what have you, but they trusted me enough to say, Joel, that's, this was a really a bad idea and you need to fix it. And that's the kind of relationship I want to have with people. Nice. So I, I teach in a undergraduate healthcare administration program. And um, uh-huh. so I have young people who are, you know, heading out into their to their first jobs uh, in healthcare. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, why should they look to take jobs at an FQHC or a similar kind of organization? My my boss has told me this many times. You know, as you know, earlier in our conversation, you said I came out of the managed care world. And I worked at Hospital Corporation of America and. The Cross Blue Shield and other organizations. And he reminds me daily, almost daily, how he saved my soul from the managed <laughs> care work. Okay. And, and so when you were talking about these people, why they should, these newly minted grads, why they should go into the F2HC world, is, is I think it's soul saving. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I think that it's such a great mission. Uh, you're helping people that really don't, a lot of times don't have any other options but to go to an FQHC. If people don't have insurance in a lot of states, primary care providers, others won't take them. And so uh, this population is just wonderful to work with. It's hard work. It's complex work, which makes it fun and interesting. No, no two days are ever the same, ever the same. I've been doing this now for 31 years at an FQHC and and um, I think maybe back in an afternoon in 1997, I had a little tiny bit of boredom for about an hour. Uh, otherwise, it is exciting, interesting, challenging, fulfilling, soul-saving work. That's a, that's a great recommendation. 
Uh, Joel, thank you so thank much you. for your time today. I appreciate all the insight you've given given me and, and uh, my students into FQHCs, CMHCs, and so forth. And it's a great conversation. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate being here and wish you and your family uh, happy holidays. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.